We have something in the range of four million stillbirths, that is babies born dead. That's called stillbirth, caused by maternal disease. And these diseases affect the passenger inside because the passenger will die if the environment of the carrier is too, so bad, so unhealthy, that the proper passenger will die. In addition to that, we have in the range of three million early neonatal deaths directly caused by the same situation. And these three million are firstly one million preterm births. Those are the babies being very low birth weight, very vulnerable. We have about one million being asphyxiated, that is suffocated at birth when being expulsed from the woman's body or in the uterus in the womb. And one million about on congenital infection. So these, all these small coffins that you can see in the uh, cemetery I mentioned, uh, you can easily see them, but maybe you do not consider them as obstetric or maternal ill health related. But this picture is a maternal ill health picture because it shows clearly the victims, the seven or so million victims every year of the passenger deaths in the poor woman and her ill health. So we can say that in addition to these seven million deaths, there are almost half a million maternal deaths. In total, approximately 7.5 million deaths associated with poor maternal care. That is the burden, and that is much, much more than half a million maternal deaths. If we take a comparison, we know that, and that was shown also in the previous speaker's slides, all AIDS deaths per year uh, are in the range of two million. All tuberculosis deaths per year in the range of 1.5. All malaria deaths per year 1.3 or even lower than that. And if we add these together, that is five million deaths. And I just quoted you to say that in my area of obstetric deaths, we have 7.5. Now it's true, as we heard also, that some maternal deaths are AIDS related. Some maternal deaths are malaria related. But if we take them together and really analyze them, we can say for sure that obstetric deaths, maternal ill health related deaths are more, most probably more than all these three um, disease, AIDS, TB and malaria together. Now, I would underline that we shouldn't have any competition in misery statistics, but there is clearly, I think, a need of much more attention to a non-recognized and ignored crucial challenge of maternal ill health and death. I say that because I happen to know how much money the Global Fund against malaria, TB, and um, AIDS uh, have brought together. There's a huge you know, amount of money. That's very good. I very much applaud that. But I have counted that the amount of money spent on AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis is in the range of 300 times as much as we put on maternal health so far. A couple of years back, that was true. So 300 times more. And I'm not saying that we should reduce the fight against malaria, tuberculosis, and and AIDS, but I say we must pay much more and acknowledge the fact that we have a huge problem, an unrecognized iceberg called a pregnancy associated deaths. And that is really unrecognized. Here we have not only problem of money, and I would say that we can transfer one trillion US dollars from New York to Dar es Salaam, where I live just now, in one microsecond, no problem. But we cannot make magic about the half a million missing midwives in the world. It will take one or two or three generations to create them. We do not do it sufficiently. Human resources are at stake. In uh, the area I live in, Dar es Salaam, and in western Tanzania, close to Kigoma in westernmost Tanzania, we have one medical doctor physician per two million people. One medical doctor physician in two million people. Who is going to make the cesarean sections on these people? Who is going to make the life-saving skills? Of course not the physician, because there are so few. And therefore these countries more and more have, have been forced to um, use what we call now with a rather poor English expression, non-physician clinicians. They are clinicians in the sense of doing enormous job to save lives, 
but they are non-physicians in the sense of not having spent one single day at the medical school. But they do all surgery we know of very well. And that's fascinating, and that has been my main research interest over the last 20 years. I'll tell you a little bit about that very quickly. The example of Mozambique, I said, when I was there as a director in that huge maternity in the 80s, we were at war with apartheid South Africa. And um, apartheid South Africa ambushed the ambulances, which is against the international law. We couldn't send mothers along the roads from the small hospitals to big hospital. But we noted with some astonishment that we had cesarean sections carried out in the small hospitals where there were no doctors. So we went out to see what is happening there. And we discovered that theater nurses nurses in intensive care and others who had been in the operation room for years and knew how to do cesarean sections, they actually did it. And we created a system of training of three years of them, formalized, uh, they call, they're called Tecnico de Cirurgia, that corresponds to mid-level providers in other countries like Mozambique where they're called assistant medical officers. So I often get the question, are you talking about barefoot doctors? No, I'm not talking about barefoot doctors, I'm talking about something that you can see in this picture. We have, un we have examined all of them that we have trained since 1984, and on average they have two and a half years training to become a nurse, 7.6 years of professional experience in field health work in theater, three years of training in surgery. That adds up to 13 years. I have 12 years. I'm a specialist but they have 13 years, but they have different profile. We made a number of studies and very quickly, we compared cesarean sections, 2,000 of them in Maputo Central Hospital, 1,000 by them and 1,000 around by us. There was no clinically significant difference in postoperative outcomes among specialists and these people. Second study was a bigger one. We tricked, we, uh, we in, in investigated more than 10,000 operations in one province, Gaza province in southern Mozambique, and we found that um, the postoperative mortality, which we were very interested in, was very, very low. In emergency surgery, 0.4%. In elective surgery, that is planned surgery, 0.1%. Extremely low figures. And we couldn't find more deaths, and we really investigated all kinds of cases in the scientific team. So there is no question that these people are extremely competent because they have a high, very heavy burden, they are very overloaded, and they have a huge experience after some years. How much work do they manage? And this is the most important study we made that's published three years ago in the British Journal of Sets and Gynecology. And we checked three tracer operations. The so sections, I think you know what that is, Next category, that is when you take away the womb, you remove the uterus because of bleeding or laceration or whatever. And the third one is ectopic pregnancy, that is when the pregnancy is outside in the, outside the uterus and the fertilized ovum is um, in, uh, retained in the tube outside the uterus. And we had the question, how much, how many, how many percent of these um, people uh, operated upon uh, operated upon by non-doctors, and we found that 92% of all of the studies were done by non-doctors very well. That's a salvation for these women. Hadn't been, they been there to do this, we would have been very, very uh, much worse off. So conclusion is that non-physician clinicians in Mozambique, Malawi, and Tanzania, where we have been doing this research, carry most of the burden of life-saving emergency obstetric care, particularly cesarean sections, with adequate skills in the countries investigated. Is this enough? We don't think it is, because we must do much more. So Mozambique is now the first country in the world to train specialized midwives to perform major obstetric surgery. And I'm going to show you one minute film, if we're it, then I will stop. I'll show you a film of the first cesarean section by a midwife in Mozambique, and it's very quick. So we take, this is a midwife, in Sweden 150 years ago. She's also a non-physician clinician because she did what doctors do now. Emilia Kumbana's face, if you compare it with the black and white midwives 150 years ago in Sweden, it strongly suggests that midwives are the category who will save these maternal lives. Doctors will never do it. We need other categories. Emilia's face, 
is a sign of hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. I prefer to stand here because now I can see you in the light there. It's impossible to see you all. We are going to have a panel now. We are not going to have a break. You are allowed to stand up if you want, but please do not go away from your chair um, because it will take some time to uh, get back again. Um, if you want to pose a question, please go to that corner the man with the red uh, jacket will take your questions. Um, Mr. Stöder has to leave quite early, so uh, please, if you want to pose questions for him, um, be quick and, and uh, you have to line up afterwards for posing your questions. Please be, please be careful to pose short questions we all know that um, you have stories to tell. Unfortunately, not, it's not the time to tell stories. Um, uh, so I would like to invite the, the speakers to come to the panel, please. <clears throat> 